Hello, I'm Ralph Cable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This is the first video on schematic capture. And you might ask, well, why more than one video on the topic? Well, when I was introduced to schematic capture, I took a multi-day course on the topic. It is a huge topic. For that reason, this first video is intended to help you understand the foundations of what makes up a schematic in schematic capture. I mean, what are all the pieces and parts and stuff and things in there? Additionally, I will attempt to sensitize you to the principles behind making awesome, useful schematics. In the next video, I will actually be going through the process of creating a schematic for our project in order to demonstrate the process. Now, I won't bore you with watching me draw every connecting line or arranging things in the page, but I will give you the tools to do these things for yourself. But <laughs> that's the next video. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So let's begin by defining exactly what schematic capture is. In the past, schematics were painstakingly drawn by hand using templates and rulers. Each symbol and each connection was hand drawn on special paper. As a young electrical engineer, I had drawn many of them using these exact templates. In most cases, because of the type of work I was involved in at the time, these were turned into working devices by point-to-point -point wiring or using what is called wire wrap. When the intent was to produce commercially created PC boards, these schematics were then carefully and painstakingly manually transferred to a PC board design, trace by trace, using various methods. Well, all of this has changed with the advent of the PC and graphic design software. Now we draw our schematic using what is called schematic capture software. This software contains a huge selection of ready-made components that you can just place right in your schematic from their libraries. Some of the design packages are very, very expensive, such as ORCAD, which is what I used as a professional product design engineer for many years. Yet, there are a number of either free or reasonably affordable packages out there which will allow you to create some truly awesome designs. The one that I use here is DipTrace. They have a freeware version, which gives the total power of the full paid version but limited to designs not to exceed 300 pins. Now I've put a link to the freeware version down in the description for you below. This package is a complete package allowing you to do everything you need to do to design your own PC boards. So now we ask the question, what makes up a schematic in a captured schematic? Well, at its most basic level, there are only two things that make up a schematic. The schematic components and the connections between those components. So let's understand these things a little bit more, starting with the components. Well, schematic components are things like resistors and capacitors and diodes, integrated circuits, connectors, transistors. Then we have to ask, what makes up a component in a schematic capture schematic? Well, the most obvious answer to this question is the schematic symbol itself. In many cases, these are internationally recognized symbols, such as with resistors and capacitors and ductors and diodes and the like. But even here, there can be variations depending upon region and the standards being followed for the schematic. There are even special IEEE symbols which have emerged in recent years which in many cases bear absolutely no resemblance to the former conventions. Me, personally, I don't particularly care for them. Sometimes schematic symbols are nothing more than, well, just a rectangle. Then there are the pins, which are the connections to the component. Pins have two things associated with them. First, they have a pin number. 
This most often refers specifically to the physical PIN number on the device. Second, they have a PIN name. In many cases, the PIN name describes the function of the PIN such as VN or reset or maybe B for the base of a bipolar transistor or some other such things. These names usually reflect the PIN names given in the datasheet for the component. In some cases, the PIN name is the same as the PIN number, such as with resistors and capacitors. And then lastly, these components on the schematic represent real physical entities. These real physical entities have real physical dimensions, which need to be met when creating a PC board that they will populate. These are called patterns or PCB footprints. So each schematic symbol you see in a schematic has a specific physical reality associated with it, which is realized only when we get to designing the actual PC board. Now, there are many, many components available in the libraries that come with the dip trace program. And so you can search the libraries for what you need and then just drag and drop the thing into your schematic. Done. However, there are times when it just doesn't exist in any of the libraries. The good news is that you can create your own custom parts to fit your particular needs. You define the symbol you define the pins and then either select a supplied standard pattern or create your own custom PCB footprint pattern for your part. When you create your own component to place in your schematic, you can borrow symbols from existing components or use one of the many templates that are available or just create your own from scratch. When placing the pins, you can choose to mimic the physical location of the pin on the physical part itself, or you can group them, well, any way that makes sense for the schematic. You can break the component up into several pieces, just as, well, like an op-amp chip that has four op-amps. You can make a part with several sections, one for each op-amp, and then one for the power and ground connections. Then there are the special case of hierarchical blocks. Well, you might ask, what in blazes is a hierarchical block? Well, you might think of them as a circuit module that can be placed over and over and over again in your schematic. So suppose you have a particular circuit that is going to appear multiple times in your project. You are faced with a choice. You can draw and redraw the same circuit over and over again in your schematic, or you could create a hierarchical block once and then place this block as a whole in your schematic as many times as you choose. The advantage of the second is that should you decide that you need to change a component value or maybe a connection or maybe just gut the entire design of that circuit and start over, you only have to do it in one place, and it changes everywhere that you've placed the block. Now that we have all of our components in place, let's connect them together. All well, the connections on a schematic are called schematic nets. Each of these nets must have a unique net name. Every net that has the same net name is assumed to be connected together. Now, this is true regardless of where it appears in the schematic, or even if there's any overt line on the schematic connecting the two occurrences. The schematic capture package will automatically assign sequential net names to each connection you establish behind the scenes. You don't have to do anything. Alternately, you can name individual nets to reflect their purpose or signal identity. The schematic capture package might name the net Net123, and you can change its name to Reset underscore N, because while this net is the reset input of the processor, that is asserted low, and thus the underscore N on the end. You don't have to remember any longer that Net123 is a reset signal, 
nor do you have to trace it back to the processor to discover that it is the processor's reset signal. While net names are not automatically displayed on the schematic, you can choose to have them displayed in key places to make it more readable and self-explanatory. There are three categories of connections that can be made on a schematic. The first are the point-to-point -point connections. And there are three ways that you can make point-to-point -point connections. The first is individual point-to-point -point connections using wires. These appear as a simple line from the pin on one component to the pin on another component. And then there are multiple point-to-point -point connections using what's called a bus, which contains either a homogeneous or heterogeneous collection of signals. Now this is often used to gather related signals together to transport them as a group from one place to another. One such example might be from a dip switch to a microcontroller. This appears as a thickened line across the schematic and breakouts along the way to collect and distribute signals. And then finally, there are the inferred connections that I spoke of earlier. When you have two or more places where the net names are the same, these are assumed to be connected together. Sometimes you just can't avoid doing this. But you should make every effort to avoid this method of connecting things together because they make a schematic very hard to use. The second category of connections are the global connections using net ports such as power and ground symbols. The power and ground symbols have names associated with them. All of the symbols that have the same name are assumed to be connected together. This way, you can have multiple power supplies. You can also have multiple grounds, such as analog and digital grounds, which, well, this is often used in mixed signal designs to keep the digital noise from infiltrating the analog signals. Finally, the third is a multi-page schematic. Connections are made between pages using ports. These can be individual signals, or they could be bus type ports carrying several signals. All ports with the same name are assumed to be connected together even if they appear on several pages of the schematic. Now that we have the basics down about what schematic capture is all about and what makes up the schematic we create with it, I need to talk about some good to follow rules about creating schematics that will make your schematic a good tool and an excellent piece of documentation. When creating a schematic, we have to keep two distinct purposes in mind. The first and most obvious is that it defines the circuitry that will be realized in the resulting PC board complete with real life physical components. If this was our only purpose for the schematic, then we could create this any way we wanted. Just throwing stuff on the sheet, running wires and buses everywhere, the willy-nilly approach to schematic creation. And I've seen and had to use schematics that seem to have been created in this fashion. Not only are they not a pretty sight, but they are impossible to use without significant effort. But the second and often forgotten aspect of schematic creation is that it is intended to be a method of documenting the design. Technicians trying to troubleshoot a product need a schematic that talks to them about what is what and maybe sometimes even the why behind stuff. What can they expect at this spot or another spot? In fact, even the designer needs to have this information maybe six months down the road when faced with a manufacturing or reliability issue. The schematic needs to answer the question for the engineer, what on earth did I do here? And maybe sometimes, why did I do it that way? To this end, I want to give you some rules to live by when creating a schematic. Number one. Signal flow likes to be from left to right, top to bottom. Well, admittedly, maybe this is just because English reads left to right, top to bottom, and 
well, English is my first language. Every schematic that I've ever dealt with has this same signal flow. But this just makes sense to me. Whichever direction you go, be consistent. Number two, neat and tidy. Now, if you wouldn't provide a finished assembly document that was poorly organized, contained misspellings, had odd paginations separating critical elements of a paragraph, maybe ill-placed illustrations, all this kind of stuff, then don't create a schematic that is a mess either. Number three, use global power and ground nets for power and ground. Don't clutter the schematic with wires everywhere that makes power and ground connections. Number four, name significant nets with names that are indicative of purpose or identity and have them be displayed in appropriate places along the schematic wire. Maybe, you know, maybe at the beginning and in the middle and at the end, anywhere to make sure that it's easy to follow where that net goes to and is coming from. So here's a couple examples. CH1 underscore audio underscore in. This would be the audio input from channel one. PTT underscore IN or IN underscore N is the push to talk input, which is negatively asserted as indicated by the underscore N suffix. In other words, low is active. Number five, while giving a net a name in one place on a stub of wire and then duplicating this on another stub of wire somewhere else in the schematic is a way of connecting the two stubs together. Avoid this everywhere and anywhere you can. This practice leads to a hunting expedition with it, which is nothing less than frustrating. Number six, label sections of the schematic indicating the function blocks they belong to. This way a person knows that this section of the schematic is say, well, the input amplifier for channel one. And finally, number seven, add notes like expected voltages at specific points and maybe under what conditions these voltages should exist. Whatever you can anticipate might be helpful to a person troubleshooting the circuit. So from here, you can make up your own additional rules like Gibbs and NCIS, but always remember Gibbs rule number 45. Always clean up the mess you make. Well, at this point, you should have at least an idea of what schematic capture is all about and a little bit about, well, what's under the hood. In the next video, I will walk through the actual process of creating a schematic using dip trace. By the time I'm done there, you should have a better idea how to do it for yourself. And then there's just, well, practice. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.